Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today. If you're just hopping on, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. And we're really excited for our conversation today. We will get started in about two to three minutes. All right, for everyone just joining, we're about to get started in about a moment. And just wanted to say thank you for making time today to join our conversation and hear from our panelists. If you uh, have a moment, please introduce yourselves in the chat. You can include where you're from, your pronouns, uh, whose land you're on, uh, whatever you would like, and we will get started in just a moment. Okay, we're going to get started because we have a very exciting conversation today and I want to give folks time to ask questions as well as potentially separate into breakout rooms based on your interests and experiences with public record requests and the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA. So really excited for the event. I, we will get to our panelists in just a few moments, but also want to thank them for their time today. We want to start today with a land acknowledgement. We at the Bridges Center in Seattle acknowledge that our lives and our institutions occupy the unceded ancestral homelands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Snoqualmie, and Puyallup peoples past and present, as well as the Muckleshoot, Tulalip, and other Coast Salish peoples and their descendants. We acknowledge that past to remind ourselves that we live and work on co colonized land and that the racial and colonial violence waged by the US empire is ongoing. The website in the chat is a helpful resource for learning more about whose land you're on, nativeland.ca. Additionally, we've shared a link to Real Rent Duwamish. We urge folks to visit the website, pay rent if you're able to do so, and learn about the Duwamish people's ongoing pursuit of federal recognition, as well as learning about local indigenous led movements where you live. Here at the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies, we are participating in Labor Spring. Labor Spring is happening across the country uh, from Hawaii to the East Coast. And it is a variety of events and opportunities to engage with folks uh, in their work, with their work and what's going on and really just have these conversations that we need to be having. So we have upcoming events in the next couple of weeks. Tomorrow we have Contracting Freedom race, empire, and U.S. guest worker programs. And we will have an online event next week, worker memorial, the Worker Memorial Day Ceremony, uh, Worker Justice and Climate Justice. So I encourage folks to go on labor.uw.edu to learn more about these events. And please join us in person and online when you're able to. So I'm really excited to introduce our panelists today. I have the opportunity to know our first one fairly well and esteemed former colleague and current friend. 
Uh, Joy Sinicone uh, is a union researcher at SEIU Healthcare 1199 Northwest. Joy supports union membership primarily in public hospital and public healthcare settings. Prior to her current position, Joyce was an organizer with SCIU and UFCW. Is there anything you'd like to add, Joyce? No, thank you. Excited to be here. Thank you. Phil Neff is a research coordinator for the University of Washington Center for Human Rights. Phil supports projects related to justice for crimes against humanity in El Salvador and immigrant, immigrant rights here in the Pacific Northwest. Phil, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, no, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. Of course. And last but definitely not least, Trevor Griffey is a labor historian at UC Irvine and UCLA. He's the co-founder of the Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project and the co-editor of Black Power at Work, Community Control, Affirmative Action, and the Construction Industry. Trevor, would you like to add anything? Nope. Great. Well, I'm glad to have you all here today, and we will get started with our panelists in just a moment. Folks uh, who are here today may already be fairly well versed in both the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA, as well as public record laws in their state or here in the state of Washington. But to make sure we're starting from at least the same base level knowledge, we wanted to just go over a couple of things. First, the Freedom of Information Act, which has been around for quite some time now, but has been expanded and changed uh, multiple times, including after Watergate, allows for all people, regardless of their immigration status and regardless, regardless of where they live in the world, uh, their nationality or location, to request records that exist from US federal agencies. These agencies are there and then are required to disclose information through the FOIA process, unless it falls under nine exemptions which we will get into, I'm sure, throughout this uh, conversation today. In addition, if your request is denied in full or in part, you can choose to appeal and go through sometimes a lengthy process that, again, we may get into a little bit more today. Since we are based in the state of Washington, the Harry Bridges Center, we are going to talk today about Washington State's Public Records Act. However, we will other states' public records laws may come up as well. So, and if you have specific questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. The Public Records Act in Washington State was adopted by voters in 1972. And lots of times folks will use FOIA just kind of blanketly. However, uh, public records uh, refers to requests that are from non-federal agencies. So local government agencies, the city or the county or the state as well. So this can include departments, districts, and including even public hospitals, which Joyce will talk to us about a little bit uh, later. Within five days of receiving a request, uh, the Public Records Act does require an agency to at least acknowledge the receipt of request. And like the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA, persons can appeal if the request is denied in part or in full. So before we uh, turn it, I turn it over to the wonderful Joyce to talk about her experiences. I wanted first to ask folks to put in the chat uh, any questions that you have now and throughout this process. After our speakers uh, present their uh, experiences as well as their thoughts on Public Records Act and FOIA, we will be breaking out into breakout groups hopefully, and uh, we may do that based on themes of questions that are coming up. And participants can just jump into whichever breakout room best fits your interests and your needs today. So please put those questions as well as what brought you here uh, into the chat, and that will help us determine the breakout rooms. So without uh, further ado, I am going to turn it over to the wonderful Joyce. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, so I am Joyce Sinicone. I use she, her pronouns, <clears throat> and I've worked with unions and union members for the last nine years and about five of those as a labor researcher. I was trained under the amazing and brilliant Rachel Erstad, our brilliant facilitator today. And I work with, like she said, healthcare members at SEIU 1199 Northwest who work in public healthcare facilities and public hospital districts, which basically mean they're locally controlled hospitals. And that includes folks that you see here on the slide. So people at Harborview Medical Center, UW Medical Center here in Seattle, and also folks um, at Evergreen Health, like I said, Valley Hospital in Goldendale, and Olympic Medical Center in Port Angeles, so all over the state. And my work is really led by the field. So 
that just means like I help analyze data that supports the needs of people on the ground. So union members and um, organizers that work in partnership with union members. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So um, here I've listed some common reasons that I personally submit public workers requests and that might be different from other folks in labor. First, I use it in verbal support, and that just means like when we're negotiating contracts with um, employers that have employees that are unionized. That's like when the employer is refusing to provide information that we have a right to and that we need. Um, I submit public records requests, um, or like the screenshot here, I'm digging deeper into financial data. So um, if it's not publicly available, I'll just like shoot off an email and request it. I also request them for employer accountability. So like, for example, when the Board of Commissioners approved COVID-19 relief funds, which triggered that their leadership will get bonuses, that is possibly problematic behavior that I would like to understand better. Um, or another example is like, I wanted to know how much money Yuba Medical Center got in donations during the pandemic. How was this money used? And give me the contact information of every single donor so that we could be like, hey, person in the community, do you know how much of an asshole Yuba Medical Center is? And not like their public persona. So, um, and also for strategic research, um, the first two reasons are kind of more reactionary, but strategic research is more forward thinking. Um, like if I want to understand employers' short and long-term goals, what are their priorities? Where do they want to expand? This is information that could really help us in the future. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So let's discuss briefly how to submit a public records request. And this is something anyone can do, like Rachel said, we all absolutely have the right to do this, not just fancy researchers or you know other fancy people. Um, the first thing I do is I Google the name of the entity plus public records request, and that'll take me to a web page where I can see exactly how they accept public records requests, like through a portal, via email, submit by mail, you could call it in or go in person. I personally like to submit it via their portal or email because the labor paper trail that will help us if we need to hold an employer accountable later. And um, next you just fill out the form that they might provide or you can make your own template. I provided screenshots of the form that I had to fill out and like my own template. Basically just cite the like FOIA law or public records requests that Rachel showed us earlier. Um, and I personally like to use broad terms so that they can't say like, oh, we don't have a report because that's not what they're calling it technically. I like to use like any and all documents so that they can be really broad and or maybe I'll just list a bunch of terms um, so that they can provide things that and just so that they don't say like, oh, we don't have that. <clears throat> and then just provide your contact information. And then lastly, um, just keep note of timelines for follow-up in case they don't respond. Next slide. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention um, in the last slide is that employers aren't always transparent about who to submit public records requests to. Sometimes you actually have to call them and like track down the right person and that lack of transparency makes it really hard to get access to information that we all have the right to. Um, and Rachel mentioned earlier that there are processes for accountability and labor unions, of course, have lawyers on staff that hold are accountable um, because they're public institutions and they have to be accountable to the community that they serve. And they must make information accessible to all of us in good faith. But absolutely, community members can take action by organizing public contact. You can take out newspaper ads. You can write editorials and shame entities for not providing information that they are required to provide the community. So thanks. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that. And then um, here, let's talk about tracking and analyzing the data, because this is what I like to do next after I submit a public records request. 
because it can take weeks or months for responses to start coming in. And reviewing, tracking, and analyzing data can sometimes feel really daunting. So just stay organized on the front end and by making a tracking document like this, it'll really help save um, headaches later. I provided a screenshot of a tracking Excel spreadsheet that we used for requests for information that we used during bargaining. Um, it could look similar to this, um, but so what I did was each row is a question that I asked, and then each column includes the responses that I got, missing information, and follow-up requests. Honestly, your tracking doesn't have to be this involved, but with large amounts of information and data dumps, it could really help you keep track of what you did and did not receive. Next slide. <clears throat> so I want to talk about some best practices that are honestly really hard for me to follow, but I've hated myself so many times. I went the hard way um, and they might seem obvious, but it really helps, first of all, if you're working with a team to clarify the roles, like who's doing what, because like if one person thinks like the other person is saving things and not really, it just like can cause lots of problems later. Um, and for example, uh, yeah, like if you need to hold an entity accountable, just all of these paper trails will really be helpful to you, um, sometimes months after the fact. Um, next, obviously save and track the documents as soon as you can, like as they come in, like, Kicked myself so many times for not doing this, but sometimes um, employers use internal portals, like I mentioned before, that have limits on like when you can access them. So if you don't save them right away, it would probably be a really big pain to try to get access to it again and waste of time. And rename the files to names that are relevant and summarize information to you because here is an actual folder. <laughs> with just a little screenshot of some of the data I got. And like, what does 22 parentheses one mean? Like, I have no idea. And I would have to like months later go back and look and that's just a waste of time. So yeah, those are some perspectives. Next slide. Um, common issues that I've come across um, when using public records requests is the timeline. So. Um, oftentimes, the timeline for receiving information is much longer. I could go back to the last one. I'm getting the last slide. But anyway, the uh, timeline can be much longer than the actual desired timeline. Like, I will get responses months after I actually need it. And um, employers could be jerks and try to, like, delay the process and say, like, you need to promise. You know, you can use this for commercial purposes, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they can actually be like, they could actually provide information that's really hard for you to analyze and review. Like they'll send you spreadsheets as PDFs and make it really small or mail you boxes of actual paper copies. That has happened to us. It's horrible. Or make you come in person and pick up a thumb drive and use those annoying servers that aren't easily accessible. And most of all, they could deny that they had the information and they like they must have the information. Um, those are some common issues that I've come across. Next slide. And that's all I have. I put a screenshot of my contact information. You can text me, call me, um, email me. I'm happy to discuss any questions people have. But hopefully, my presentation made it feel really accessible and easy for anyone really to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. I'm wondering if really quickly before we transition over to Phil, if you can talk just a little bit about the role of tracking public records requests and information from employers and unfair labor practices. Yeah, I um employers have definitely denied that they have information that is such a classic boss move um, or they'll uh, like in, um, during bargaining during 
like on twenty requests for information, they'll just like um, basically drag out the process and make it really confusing to track things. But um, that's when really saving everything, being really organized, because sometimes months and months later, you don't even know that you're gonna start a legal process, and yeah. all of those things that you needed to do up front are gonna be really important for like. Where is this document? What like do you have it from this? Would you have this email from this date and this attachment? Like it can yeah. be so complicated and overwhelming that um yeah, you might need a lot of information that kind of uh, came in waves a month ago. So totally. Thank you for that. Uh definitely a tool that we utilize a lot. So uh, thank you, Joyce. I'm going to stop share because we are going to have our next uh, participant is going to share screen. So please let me know if you have any issues with that. Bill. Uh, is it working? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so thanks, uh, Rachel, for the background on uh, FOIA and public records and, and Sharon for um, talking about how you've used uh, these laws and um, some of the nuts and bolts about how you uh, put in requests, very similar um, to the way we work here at the University of Washington Center for Human Rights. Um, and uh, like you, Sharon, we um, we strive to do research at the service of front lines, uh, organizations working for human rights, both locally and uh, internationally. And so I'm gonna just share a few examples um, of the kinds of records that we've been able to obtain uh, through FOIA and through state public records um, as just sort of, and I'll go quickly and, and briefly sort of just as an example of the kinds of uh, sort of impacts that, that these records have had for our research and then can talk more about uh, specifics in response to questions or in the breakout groups. Um, and, yeah, so I already talked a little bit about our, our motivations as a center. Um, the University Center for Human Rights has been around for uh, well, a little over 12 years. Are you seeing my, um, my video? Can you see the full full slide? Okay. Um, we've been around for about 12-ish years, uh, and, and uh, we um, use FOIA and public records uh, research in uh, the majority of our projects. Um, and uh, do a lot of uh, one of the best parts of my job is working with the student researchers who coordinate, analyze, um, submit our, our public records and FOIA requests. Um, so one of the projects that we have uh, used the Freedom of Information Act in extensively is a project supporting survivors of crimes against humanity in El Salvador, which as I'm sure many of you know, um, had a uh, there was an internal armed conflict in El Salvador in which the U.S. government supported the Salvadoran um, government and military to the tune of more than five billion dollars in um, military and other aid during the 1980s. And so, um, given the extreme level of uh, U.S. involvement in the country, um, you know, it's there are huge archives of, of documents held by federal agencies uh, about the. Uh, the conflict. And so what we have done, um, following the footsteps of other researchers, um, particularly uh, uh, the National Security Archive at George Washington University in DC, um, using uh, the FOIA to uh, request records relating to uh, cases of crimes against humanity in El Salvador. So for example, um, the document showing here is about um, a uh, military operation associated with a massacre um, in uh, the early 1980s. Um, and we were able to obtain through a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit um, against uh, the CIA, um, this document which confirmed uh, one, of the, um, one of the officers in the chain of command of that, uh, um, of that operation. Um, Another document that we've received more recently um, is is kind of the 
the kind of document I personally never thought we would find, um, a, a document that specifically names the intellectual and material authors of, of torture and disappearance of uh, political prisoners, including uh, teachers union organizers um, in El Salvador in the late 70s. Um, I think it's truly remarkable that 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 this document exists and um, the uh, you know the most important part of, of the work for us is that um, this document was able to be shared with the family of Efraina Revelo um, and other um, others of the organizers um, who were mentioned in that in that document and they were able after more than uh, 30 years uh to hold a a ceremony um in san salvador uh celebrating his life and um uh you know with the uh, with with some degree of information about um you know what what happened to him at the hands of the salvadoran state um so those are just a couple of the you know the highest level uh impacts that have come out of uh years of using the FOIA um, to, to research these topics. Um, we've now sued the CIA, Department of Defense, uh, Defense Intelligence Agency um, on multiple occasions uh, to, to get these records. Um, and so I had really just second everything that Sharon said about keeping track of um, all correspondence relating to your public records requests, even if you think, you know, I won't have to sue for this, um, you, you, you might. Um, unfortunately, suing under the FOIA or State Public Records Act can is is extremely prohibitive, and we have the um, you know the, the benefit as uh, uh, through our affiliations with the UW of um, having pro bono FOIA um, representation uh, through Davis Wright Tremaine, um, and we're really grateful for that support. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, statistics show that more and more people are having to sue um in order to get records that that uh they are um you know by law entitled to under the freedom of information act um oh here's one more example from our el salvador work which which shows one sort of way you can um zero in on specific kinds of documents um sometimes if you're not so under the both the FOIA and Public Records Act, you can't ask broadly for information. You can't say, I want the number of people um, you know, employed by this hospital or whatever. You have to say, you have to, um, what is the record that contains that information and request that record. But if you don't know what record, you know, you can request records that have that are relevant to certain topics, but it's it's much more effective to request specific records. And so sometimes you can get. For example, a document that is an index of records that exist, and then you can very clearly say, "Get me that record." So this is an example of a index of, of classified intelligence documents um, that uh, that we have requested. And um, watch watch this space for more news about that request in in your future potentially. Um, so we have. Uh, really growing out of that work with groups in El, El Salvador uh, turned uh, some of the same tactics uh, to support for local immigrant rights organizations in the Pacific Northwest to use um, both uh, FOIA and State Public Records uh, Act. Um, so some of the folks in the chat were asking about, well, how do you get information about private corporations um, through public records acts and FOIA? Um, the answer is you can't. Uh, but if they interface with federal or public agencies that are subject to the those acts, then you can request information uh, related to those private corporations. So, for example, the GEO Group is a uh, prison contractor that runs the immigration uh, detention facility in Tacoma. Um, they're not subject to the Public Records Act, but, um, for example, we requested um, documents related to their contracts and um, inspections, for example, uh, related to um, the contracts requirements for hygiene and janitorial services, for example, and we're able to get these reports um, that uh, confirm the firsthand reports of detained people who have said the facility is disgusting, it's you know inhuman conditions, and we found records um, showing that 
ICE has documented violations of the contract and as well as ICE employees complaining about um, conditions. Um, another example folks asked about police, um, uh, police and sheriffs are also subject to the Public Records Act in Washington State. Um, and so uh, that has been a way that we've been able to get a lot of information about how um, ICE has been using police and sheriffs to target um, immigrant communities in Washington State and Pacific Northwest. Um, so oftentimes it's actually much faster and more reliable to request records from local agencies under the local public records law than it is under FOIA, which can take months or years to get a response. Um, so we ask uh, police and sheriff's agencies for copies of all their email communications with anyone at ICE or Border Patrol. And we'll be able to find things documenting like uh, this kind of uh, profiling of people um, arrested at the Clark County Jail, where a jail employee was sending emails to a buddy at uh, the Portland ICE office saying, hey, here's someone you should check. They look like they might not be a citizen. And in this case, actually, this person was a citizen. Um, so it's a very clear example of uh, profiling and also uh, information sharing with ICE, which is prohibited under Washington State's Keep Washington Working Act. Um, and then finally, uh, another you know area that you can go down numerous rabbit holes uh, around is um, when you get big data sets or big collections of records, um, and then and then need to do a quantitative analysis of those. As Sharon mentioned, it's really frustrating and difficult when uh, agencies provide you information in, for example, PDF format, and you just want a spreadsheet to be able to count some simple thing. Um, and we've had to work with um, partners, including the Human Rights Data Analysis Group in um, the Bay Area to develop uh, software to scrape data from ICE forms, for example, to get um, precise information about where um, they've been apprehending people in, in Washington State. Um, so those are some examples of how we've used FOIA in our work, and I can go into a lot more specifics. Um, and I wanted to share this. Uh, resource created by a, a former PA, a, a PhD student um, with the UW Center for Human Rights, Emily Willard, um, who was one of the masterminds of our uh, FOIA program. And she's put together this uh, freely accessible online book through UW Libraries um, specific to FOIA. And so, yeah, thanks. Um, please check out our work um, and uh, at the website here. Thank you so much, Phil, uh, for that. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about kind of the the breakdown you're working uh, with international pieces like in El Salvador, but also supporting folks here in the Pacific Northwest. Are you working on simultaneous projects or can you describe a little bit about what your work life looks like right now? Um, things have, uh, so there's, a, there's a, a bit of a ebb and flow of the intensity of different projects. The El Salvador work was um, a bit more intense a, a few years ago when there was more um, forward movement in some contemporary legal processes related to crimes against humanity in El Salvador. And unfortunately, the political situation um, under the uh, Bukele government in El Salvador has um, narrowed avenues for uh, justice in, in courts in El Salvador currently, um, but people are still fighting. Um, and uh, we've had a bit more activity in some of our FOIA work uh, in, in that topic um, over the last year or so. And then the, the work around immigrant rights um, in the Pacific Northwest has been a, a theme that the center has worked on since its inception, but um, increased uh, with the um, with the uh, start of the Trump administration as um, local immigrant rights groups were interested to learn more about how uh, they could use local policy and state law to uh, fight back against uh, federal targeting of immigrant communities. Thanks for that. Okay, so I'm excited now to turn it over to uh, Trevor Griffey, who will be talking a little bit about his work, uh, especially regarding, regarding FOIA and the FBI. So please go ahead, Trevor, when you're ready. 
Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I feel uh, excited to be on this panel, but also I wish I could just watch more of the previous two discussants. Um, I know very little about uh, organize, like using public records requests for labor unions, but I've tried to do so as a vice president of my union local uh, University Council American Federation of Teachers. Uh, we represent lecturers and librarians in the University of California system. And as everyone knows, uh, shared governance in universities is a joke. And um, the only way to get any transparency, even from academic senate, <clears throat> is to require state public records. I've tried to do that and, and would love to learn more. I also just want to give a shout out again to the UDA Center for Human Rights, uh, having used FOIA to get his, try to get historic records from the CIA. I personally gave up because their scofflaw activities were so blatant, uh, so profoundly illegal. Um, and the fact that the University of Washington even partnered with this center to find them pro bono legal assistance is a clear game changer and one that I hope that other researchers at other universities can use as a precedent for saying, UW did it, you should support me too. We need to make this a public case. This actually shows UW working for the public interest, doing public interest work. And that kind of legal assistance is especially necessary for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, anything related to the national security state past or present. I say that because uh, the kind of focus of my presentation today is on um, using FOIA for accessing FBI files. I uh, developed this skill in a sort of self-taught way when I was a graduate student at the University of Washington. Um, and when I was working on the Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, I can drop a link in the chat. Let's just make sure I send it to everyone and not just one person. So there's a link to that. Um, I had been doing social movement history for many years, and I, um, uh, a friend said, you should request somebody's FBI file. And I did, and I, I was told, or what I thought was told, uh, that there was nothing there. And I was like, that's absurd. And then I learned under the George W. Bush administration that the FBI had adopted very strict uh, means through which to respond to FOIA requests that meant that because I didn't know how to submit a request, my request was rejected even though files existed. And so I both became self-taught in trying to overcome these obstacles and also um, benefited quite a bit from legal changes uh, that the that President Obama introduced after he was elected. And so today's presentation is sort of a short summary of some of the things I learned that's geared towards historians, but at the same time uh, applies to contemporary stuff as well, but which is much harder when trying to get from the national security state. Um, before I do that, I just want to note, because of the local nature of some of the attendees, and by that I mean uh, Washington State or Seattle, I should note that once I developed this skill, I tried it out on the Seattle Police Department and found they were about as bad as the CIA in terms of accessing public records uh, and ranked one of the lowest by local uh, police departments. After I wrote an op-ed about it for the Seattle Times uh, for political reasons and not for legal compliance reasons, I was given sort of special access to their finding aid and able to access some of their historic records, which I actually think the police department has no business keeping out of the Seattle Municipal Archives, even though it has failed to comply with local law on that. And so I've just dropped a link in there to the old finding aid that was produced of its records that it historically has not made public or integrated into Seattle's municipal archives, just so that local FOIA activists have access to this. And as a model for other activists who are trying to access police department records in other cities. <laughs> okay, so with that said, let me now share screen. Give me a second to make sure that I share the right screen. There it is, good. And go to slideshow. All right, so a few tips about FOIA, some of which I think are implicit in others' presentations so far. Uh, first, um, some of the stuff, especially if you're doing historical work that you request, 
uh, may have been destroyed. Some record destruction is legal and some is not, uh, but either way, it's possible that even though you know the records may have existed at some point, they may not anymore. Second, the language you use to make a request can be used against you or for you. Um, if you don't reference certain things, uh, agencies develop rules through which they decide because you didn't reference XYZ law or specifically provide me XYZ information, I'm going to reject this request and not tell you in any detail what you need to do to revise the request. So it's very helpful to look at the kind of how-to guides that Phil posted up prior uh, or look at other online guides uh, before you submit a request. Uh, the, sec the third thing is that even though federal, state, and county law, city law may require uh, that an agency tell you when it's withholding materials, there are national security exemptions to notifying you of that. So in addition to the redactions, in, a different, in addition to the withholding, you also have categories of files, which the FBI and other agencies won't even tell us what they are when people have tried to FOIA, like the rules that govern how they respond to records requests. Uh, and there are categories of records that we're simply not allowed to know if they exist. And, um, and we may not ever be told that. And so even if we get a proper response or what we think is a proper response, you should never presume absolute completeness in terms of these things, especially when it relates to national security. Uh, the other thing to note is that FOIA law, like many laws in this country, kind of came out of various kinds of struggle, that it was improved at certain moments uh, with certain assumptions, and that uh, ever since Ronald Reagan, it's been hard to get any changes that would make it better or respond to the times. And therefore, we're uh, subject to a really horrible system in which, on the one hand, to protect privacy, law enforcement practices, and national security, uh, somebody is required to review every single page of every document uh, before they release it to you. And this can go back decades and even as much as a century. And, and this inefficient system produces a means through which um, uh, when Congress or various other government bodies don't properly fund these agencies, or when the agencies themselves don't allocate specific funds for the process, it means that it produces a backlog. Um, one way to prevent that backlog was just to deny requests uh, heavily, which is what the FBI did in the early 2000s. But once the FBI and later the CIA were forced to comply with the E-FOIA Act of 1996, and actually receive requests via email, because up till that point, they were making you write a letter and engage in kind of postal stuff, and they weren't releasing any files electronically. Once they had to comply with that act about 15 years after the fact, then a whole bunch of shell games started where um, triage and various systems began where it can take year, it can take months to get a substantive response and it can take years to get a, uh, a release, even a partial release of a large file. And then finally, I just wanna note again, and this is why I plugged uh, Phil Neff's uh, point and presentation is that when dealing with the CIA, in my experience, I, th I think also the State Department on a lot of things, um, when dealing with uh, post 1970s files that relate to anything that might be called domestic terror, or, uh, domestic security, um, anything transnational, oftentimes uh, the courts need to be invoked in order to actually get federal agencies to comply with FOIA. Uh, they develop rules that are often out of sync. They might not make those rules public. And, um, and so the process of trying to get these things out may not, it may be impossible or very, very limited just using the request process itself. I'm gonna pause there to mute my phone. I apologize, somebody decided to send me a lot of texts right in this moment. Uh, and I did not think, because I was on Zoom and not in an in-person classroom to turn off my phone before this, but I've now successfully muted it. Having given that long presentation, I probably don't have quite much, very much time to, to cover the substance of what I wanted to offer, but thankfully we have a breakout room space to talk about FBI declassification, and I'll um, depend on Rachel to tell me a little bit when I've reached time. 
Um, the first to note is that the main thing that most historians tend to request are FBI files during the J. Edgar Hoover era and a little bit before. Uh, this is the era of what you might call the paper file <clears throat> before the digitization of records. And it roughly correlates with a time when the FBI uh, policed in broad brushstrokes what it called subversion, which by which it usually meant anti-capitalism, but which could extend to other social movements. Um, the second thing to note is during this period, uh, there would be a headquarters file, but there would also be field office files. The FBI has dozens of field offices. Usually one field office is designated the office of origin, and the office of origin tends to have a more substantial file than the headquarters. So if you just get the headquarters file, but you don't get the office of origin or other field office files, it means that all the primary source materials that the FBI itself uses to produce knowledge about what it considers to be threats to national security, uh, that these will be left out of your records. And those kinds of things include informant reports, newspaper clippings, which tend to be quite helpful, sometimes verbatim transcripts of people's speeches. Um, and actually, since the FBI's kind of right-wing politics uh, tend to overdetermine the language it uses in description of its reports. It's these primary sources that tend to be more valuable to historians. Um, a couple things make it difficult to try to gain access to things since the 70s. The first is that a shift to a, a rubric of war on terror has um, allowed for certain kinds of exemptions or a liberal use of exemptions that are not applied to this era of kind of the file during J. Edgar Hoover's time. Um, and I just sort of wanted to note that. But the other thing to note is that there's sort of a vast collection of files, even just related to national security. This isn't just talking about the FBI more generally, which also enforces a lot of laws unrelated to national security, but related to the federal government and, and Congress. Uh, but related to national security, the FBI has always been a transnational agency. It has always had what it calls legal attaches around the world. Uh, at first in Latin America uh, during World War II was vying to kind of become the CIA, though it didn't happen. Uh, but even after the CIA was developed, the FBI has, uh, has monitored the transnational movements of radicals, especially anti-capitalists in the name of the Cold War. It has trained police forces, including in fascist governments, uh, especially in Latin America. Uh, throughout the last 50 to 75 years, it engages in that practice today under the rubric of the war on drugs. It also is heavily involved in monitoring activities of peoples in the Middle East. And uh, these files are ones that we have much less access to, so there's a lot less popular knowledge about them. I wrote a brief article about how to access them for the uh, Organization of American Historians blog titled FBI Files on Countries Around the World that gives a little bit of an overview of the kinds of records I was able to at least identify existed as it related to some Cold War activities uh, in Latin America. But I just wanted to note that this is a sort of untapped archive. I've consulted with people who have sought to gain these files in Uruguay as well as a few other countries. Uh, it takes years to get them and they come back heavily redacted because one of the things that the FBI has is it has State Department, CIA, and uh, uh, Pentagon records that flow through its files. And once it does that, anytime it has a CIA record, it redacts it, refers it to the CIA, and the CIA then sits on it or maybe releases it, but usually doesn't. And, um, and so even though the CIA may have destroyed the record, this backdoor attempt to get the records still can be faced with all sorts of challenges. And yet I think Moon Ho Jung is on this call. I actually shared with him a file on, on Filipino radicalism that the FBI had uh, that he drew from for his most recent book. And so the files, despite their incompleteness, still tend to be valuable. Rachel, how much time do I have left? If you could wrap up in about five minutes. Sorry, could you say that again? Yes, uh, five minutes. Excellent, thank you. All right, <clears throat> so let's say you want to submit a FOIA request to the FBI. The first thing to note is, you're probably, is that you're not the first person to do so. 
And uh, the miracle of the digital age is that you can try to track down files that others have already declassified. One handy place to do that is in the National Archives. Uh, the National Archives has a collection of FBI files, uh, some of which have been declassified and some of which have not. Uh, I have a screenshot here of its link to right here. If you see this link, the catalogs, archives, and then it says 394, that takes you to record group 65, which is where the FBI's records are located. And that gives you as close as the National Archives has to its inventory on FBI files. It's not a complete inventory, and a lot of it is just file numbers that won't mean anything to you unless you actually know what the subject is, but it's at least a helpful piece of information. And, it's, and it means that if you find a subject that you're looking for, um, you might be able to direct your request there rather than the FBI. And in some cases, even in its catalog, it will have a, a link to released files. So it might take you straight to a copy of a file already which is pretty remarkable. Uh, the FBI has what it calls its vault um, of previously requested records. In almost no case does that vault contain the sum total of all FBI records on that subject. So usually if you request something related to that, the FBI will say, we're not going to release anything to you. Please refer to our records on the vault because that should answer your question but usually it's not a complete set. In some cases, it's stuff from the early 1980s that was heavily redacted that should be less redacted now if it were to be re-reviewed. In other cases, it's just a small piece of a file, um, but it can give you a place to start with. Uh, there are some for-profit companies that have partnered with the National Archives to digitize historic records, especially from the 1910s and 20s, but continuing uh, sort of marching through the 20th century, ProQuest and Fold3 are two of the most noteworthy ones. And archive.org contains a lot of materials, especially from probably one of the most prolific uh, FOIA requesters in FBI history, once said to account for 10% of all FOIA requests to the FBI, Ernie Lazar, who recently passed away. His anti-communist uh, collection, uh, both on kind of tracking the FBI's anti-communism, but also the FBI's tracking of the, the far right in the 50s and 60s is very substantial. There are also a lot of other places where you can find FBI files online, uh, and they're often mixed with uh, stuff that from UFO and alien enthusiasts, but the, but the records are real and can be valuable, but the sources may be less than reputable. So there's a really wide variety and there are occasionally academics who share these things too. The main reason I just wanted to flag that there's stuff that is worth checking out before you do this is because the most effective way to have an effective request from the FBI is to already know the file number of the subject you're looking for. And if you can find that file number in previously released records, you're in much better uh, you're in a much better situation. So here, for example, is a file from the communist, in, uh, it, from the subject file. It, I'm sorry, this is a document from the FBI, from the special agent in charge of the Atlanta field office to the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. It's as part of two different investigations that are overlapping, communist influence in racial matters or CIRM and communist influence of the SCLC. And so each file number corresponds to that subject. So the headquarters file, aka bureau file, is 100-442-529. So if I request that, I can now say, hey, FBI, I want communist influence, racial matters, headquarters file, this. Or I want the Atlanta file, 100-6670. When you request those things, it's much easier and faster for an FBI agent uh, AKA librarian to um, get back to you and say, we destroyed it. We transferred it to the National Archives so that we didn't have to deal with requests like yours, or actually we're sitting on it and it'll take us years to get back to you. Usually those are the three kinds of responses you get. And so I can later talk about uh, getting proof of death, especially from ancestry.org uh, or .com. Uh, both from famous and non-famous people that you can submit to make sure that the FBI doesn't uh, withhold pr 
information on people that you know are dead for privacy grounds, uh, how to submit a request and resources to consult. But one final thing I wanna note is there are experts in this field that you can consult with for a fee. Um, Jay Driscoll is a prominent researcher now serving a lot of major US historians of the 20th century working out of the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, uh, and has done a lot of FBI file research on site. Uh, Property of the People is a group linked to animal rights activist Ryan Shapiro that has uh, gotten hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pages of records from the FBI and CIA on a variety of uh, national and international social movements, and both are useful sources to consult with. So I'll end there and just say I can talk more in a breakout room. I hope that was a helpful introduction. I saw questions in the chat that are more sophisticated than I can probably answer already, but um, I'm grateful to be included in this panel. Uh, oh, and one final thing I'd note, in addition to FBI files on particular, um, uh, d on domestic security issues, there are lots of labor and economic history issues that overlap too. The federal government has, you know, when it prohibits uh, debt peonage, the FBI is tasked with enforcing that. And so a scholar like George Lovell can go and look at, um, you know, Professor George Lovell can, go look at records from the 1940s when the FBI is facing pressure to enforce these things. Similar things, especially during World War I and World War II labor re regulations, other stuff on unions sometimes, depending on whether they were considered infiltrated by the left. So common fill the communist infiltration and then followed by industry, not racial matters, but like by industry, like maritime industry is likely to have a lot on the ILWU, for instance. So there's lots of opportunities. The enormous tragedy is that our FOIA law is so backwards that all these things that should already be accessible to historians are locked away in cabinets and there's all this incentive to get rid of them because people say they don't have the space in the warehouse for them anymore. And um, we really need to use our professional associations more to promote declassification reform. So thank you. Thank you so much, Trevor. I really appreciate the idea of like, if you already know what the record number is, like really leading with that. And I think that came up in the chat as well. So thanks for hitting on that. So I'm going to start breakout rooms in a second. And that means I'll also pause our recording. And the breakout rooms are going to be FBI and law enforcement national. Trevor, if you could jump into that one, that would be much appreciated. Then we're gonna have CIA national and international and immigrant rights. And if we could have Phil jump into that one. Joyce, if I could have you on labor unions and worker rights. And then I am going to uh, be the person uh, kind of facilitating and taking questions and the general questions on PRA and FOIA. And the good news is uh, we say this all the time in the world of research. There's no just such thing as being an expert. Like you are always gonna be learning. There's always gonna be ideas coming in. So if there's a question that we don't know, uh, we'll get hold of you. We'll get your contact information and we'll figure it out. Uh, and I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms now. So please uh, select where you would like to go. You should be able to select yourself. And then we're going to come back together in about 25 minutes. And you can feel free, uh, I might jump around uh, or have uh, my tech person jump around to see if there's any issues. Thank you again, Andrew Hedden, the tech person of my dreams, uh, who will be going to different places in order to make sure we all have what we need. Uh, so yeah. I'm going to open up rooms and hopefully we are without any internet snafus. Okay, as folks come back together, uh, we'll give it another minute so we can hopefully get everyone back who was in the rooms. And then we're going to close it up for the day. And thank you all so much for your participation. All right, I think right. most of us are back now from our time in breakout rooms. I hope that uh, it was helpful and I hope you all learned something from today. And I would love to invite panelists and I myself will also put uh, my contact information in the chat.
I know you already did that, Joyce, but if folks are willing and able to do that, that would be excellent. Uh, I think there probably was some great conversations and want to make sure that if there's questions, follow up is possible. All right. Uh, is there any of our panelists who would like to say anything to close out our conversation today? I'd like to, we could have time for everyone to say something out of the panelists. So <laughs> please go ahead if you'd like. Okay, well, I guess everyone felt like we talked enough, which is fair. Uh, I feel like I did a lot of talking myself. So we are going to end this conversation, but I wanna thank everyone at the Bridges Center for their support, as well as definitely all three panelists and public records requests can be obnoxious, uh, especially with organizations like we're talking about today that may not want to reveal the information for a variety of reasons, but it is a tool in, a, in our tool chest as researchers. So definitely appreciate uh, what we were able to learn and discuss and please don't hesitate to reach out to the Bridges Center as myself, as well as all of our panelists with any follow-up questions. And also remember that sometimes it's better to make a call and ask for our phone numbers, <laughs> depending on if we're in public organizations like I am. So yeah, thanks again, everyone for your time today and look forward to further conversations. Take good care.